She's an award-winning YouTuber and best-selling author obsessed with helping you go after the life you want. I like it. Join her as she seeks out the stories and strategies. Give me every little detail. Of extraordinary people who found success. I'm going to get emotional. Oh, my God. Welcome to Detail Therapy with Amy Landino. I went to a a meeting with literally with Google. I sat like a couple seats over from Larry Larry Page and I'm like listening to them talk about the problems on YouTube and what they need to do. And it's very, very different from the discussions that you see on YouTube channels about YouTube's not listening to us, YouTube needs to do all these things. And there's like no overlap between the two. So me standing back and seeing both of those perspectives, I feel the need to like introduce them to each other, maybe merge them together a little bit and hopefully that helps. Hey there, welcome to Detail Therapy. You just heard a snippet of my chat with Marquez Brownlee, better known on YouTube as MKBHD, who we're gonna hear more from in just a little bit. In this episode, you'll hear Marquez talk about how he started on YouTube, his reaction to the YouTube Rewind 2018 drama, if you're not aware, most disliked video in history now, and Marquez was in it. So interesting. His tips for beginner YouTube creators, including what makes a great YouTube thumbnail. We have a lot to get into with Marquez today, but for those of you who do not know me and are new to the show, my name is Amy Landino and I will be your host. I'm a YouTube creator, professional speaker, best-selling author, and entrepreneur, and I'm here to help you go after the life you want. You can find out more details about me by visiting youtube.com slash Amy TV. So this is my first interview of the new year. Really pumped about that. Back to get into our flow here. Awesome chaps, chats to come. I'm telling you, awesome chaps and awesome chats to come. Let's just be honest about that. <laughs> um, it's really been fun. I was able to pop over to New York and sit down with some really cool people, including Marquez today and a lot more to come in the coming weeks. Um, but today... I sit here and I'm so happy to be home at the headquarters for Vlogboss Studios in Columbus, Ohio with a fresh cup of Dunkin' Donuts because that's our favorite thing to buy from Costco now is like that huge bag of Dunkin' Donuts. It's Vin's favorite and so I've just gotten on board at this point, you know. So we are definitely going to be kicking things off strong. I've probably had too much coffee so we're going to call it Coffee Strong coffee's real strong today. Before we roll into the show, I want to give a shout out to Bethany91 for her review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast Store. She said, Amy Landino is amazing, similar to her YouTube channel, while also being different by bringing other bosses on her show and telling us how to live our boss life every day. Amy will only choose to interview the most quality and relevant people and is obviously committed to her audience. Thank you, Amy, for all you do and all you are. Keep shining bright like a diamond. Right back at you, Bethany. Thank you so much for your five-star review. And no matter what stars you decide you would like to give this podcast, if you make the time to review review on your favorite podcast player. I appreciate that so much and hopefully I will give you a shout out in a future episode. Also keep in mind that everything we talk about here on this show can be found in our show notes and those are located at detailspodcast.com. So if you hear Marquez talk today about something he recommends like editing software or an electric car, I will link to everything in those show notes. So remember, it's all about the details. Go get them after the show. With that, let's get into my chat with my next guest. Today, I'm sitting down with Marquez Brownlee, known on YouTube as MKBHD. He is the mastermind behind one of the top technology review channels in the world. With a rapidly loyal community of more than 7 million subscribers and more than 1.1 billion views on his channel, Marquez has been featured on shows like the Joe Rogan podcast and Hot Ones, and on his own channel has actually been able to sit down with the likes of Kobe Bryant and Elon Musk. He even took home the Shorty Award in 2018 for Creator of the Decade. We're going to pop over to that interview with Marquez today in his offices in New Jersey, just outside of New York City. So please help me welcome MKBHD to Detail Therapy. Marquez Brownlee, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Tell me, why do you create? I create, um, I'm a nerd, and I like watching a lot of tech videos. So 
I would say I create to make what I would want to watch. And that's, that's the style of what I make. That's the content of what I make. I'd say I make a channel that I hopefully would want to subscribe to. You know, I met you, I think it's been almost five years ago. It was CES of 2014. Okay. Uh, I started going to CES because of Austin Evans. Mm -hmm. And I met you through Austin. Actually, I remember very well because I'd met you for five minutes. It wasn't even. And we were in some terrible hotel in Vegas. It was probably the Tropicana, I think. I don't remember. You guys were staying together and you were making a video and I was just kind of like, how can I help? And mm. then Austin was like, do you want us to make a video with you? And mm -hmm. I was like, I don't think Marquez wants to make a video with me. He met me five minutes ago and you were like, whatever, let's do it. I'm down. And then I had you guys talk about networking, which yes. was- <laughs> I do remember this. The, the weirdest, I think, request for you guys because I don't think you're you were used to that, but you guys, Handled it I well. Think we nailed it. Yeah, I think, I think we, we did great. It. Yeah. Um, anyway, Austin, one of my favorite people, and you guys were such good sports. But that's how long I've known you. I know you've been on YouTube for much longer than that. When did you start? I started in two thousand nine. The beginning, yeah. I would say January first, two thousand nine, uh, and then so that makes it literally about ten years. Yeah, about to be ten years. About to have your ten year anniversary. Then that that's, seems like a big that's deal. Like a whole decade. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I think you've probably told this story quite a bit, but how mm -hmm. exactly did you start on YouTube? Sure, yeah. Um, so I make tech videos. So at the beginning, uh, I was in high school and I wanted to buy a laptop. And so, you know, not having a lot of money to spend, I was really, really doing all this research about exactly what laptop to buy. And that process was just me watching a ton of YouTube videos. And so I finally got the laptop. And as I unboxed it and looked through it, I'm finding all these things I didn't see in any of the videos. So my first reaction was, you know, I, I guess I could get into this. And I started making videos of those things that I didn't see uh, when I was looking for them. So if someone found themselves in the same purchase decision dilemma that I was in, they would have more to watch and to choose from to make a better educated choice. Hmm. And then just kind of snowballed from there. So I've made videos since. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I mean, I'm not trying to say, you're not no, old was, by any stretch. I child. mean, like I said, 10 years ago, yeah. you were in high school. That was your first sort of like dabble. It started to get more serious in college, right? Yeah, I mean, it kind of was always a hobby. Uh, obviously it's scaled massively as a hobby since then, but I, I've always put like a lot of time into it just because it was fun. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you could say it got serious in college. I mean, how does it feel to know that you've basically grown up on camera? You've grown up online. To me, I started thinking <laughs> about it on the way here and I was like, this is like, the modern day child star mm. in some ways. Because I always tell my audience, you know, if you wanna feel better about making videos, go back and watch my first stuff. Yeah, I was young, but you were much younger than me when you started and it's so crazy that, you know, you probably will see every once in a while. Actually, this happened recently. Didn't your first video ever pop up on the YouTube homepage or yeah, something? Yeah, it started getting recommended to people yeah. embarrassingly, yeah. That's crazy to see, right? But then you, you see the journey, like, so for me, I as my own biggest critic, I look at like a six week old video and I cringe hard. So seeing like my first video ever show yeah. up and recommend it is kind of a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> but I do get the chance to recognize that. Yeah, I did kind of grow up on camera. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. It's really wild. I mean, and but your channel is also, it's stayed so steady for so long. Like I think a lot of people find that they end up wanting to go through a pivot mm -hmm. at some point. Have you ever felt that? Um, and maybe have you started to dabble in it a little bit? Because you are very dedicated to tech and I think that's because there's just a true passion there. But yeah. you have started to kind of like explore some other areas and is that just because you want to be able to offer more now and maybe tech isn't the whole story? I think I see it as an expansion that's still in tech. Mm -hmm. So not a pivot necessarily, but if you look back at like maybe my last 100 videos mm -hmm. in the past year, um, fun fact, it is 100 yeah, in the last year. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Um, yeah. It's like 96. But you'd probably say like 70 of them are smartphone videos. So mm -hmm. it's not just tech. It's just smartphones. Mm -hmm. And not only does that get kind of repetitive, but I also kind of feel too comfortable just doing a smartphone video, even though every phone's different. So I found that the most fun I was having was tech that's not phones, TVs, headphones, cars. Everything has a little bit of tech in it that you can talk about. Um, production gear, cameras, all this stuff, computers. Um, so I feel like my pivot, 
those are air quotes for those mm -hmm. not seeing the video version, is kind of more of just expanding into other tech-related topics and, and painting that same brush across different textures of different types of tech, anything with an on button. So speaking of things with an on button that are kind that are very much tech, but aren't, you know, the po com computer in your pocket, mm -hmm. your car is an extraordinary piece of tech. Yeah. Was that the reason you got excited about Tesla was that yes. it was so tech driven? Yeah, that's exactly. That's how I got into cars, period. Yeah. I was not into cars at all. I drove a, a Toyota hybrid for a year when I was in college mm -hmm. just because I needed a car to go to Frisbee stuff. And the first time I ever test drove a Tesla, which was kind of by happenstance, basically, uh, instantly hooked. Yeah. Where and was obsessed. that? Obsessed. That was in New York. Yeah. Oh, no, was, sorry. I'm in... getting it backwards. Okay. Am I getting it backwards? One of the first two things I ever did with Tesla was a factory tour with Austin. Okay. And during that piece, they gave me and Austin a chance to drive the car. Mm -hmm. And another thing I did was in New York, I made a video, top five Tesla Model S features, got to drive it for a day. And after those two things, I was, it's kind of a curse. It's kind of like an obsession. Cause once you drive that car, you just compare everything yeah. to that yeah. from that, that point on. Um, and that got me into Tesla, which got me into cars, which got me into electric cars and then comparing the tech between all the existing cars. So it did start with my car. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but did you do a contest video for Tesla at some I point? Did. What was that about? Yeah, a little while ago, this year actually, uh, was that Tesla. This year? It was this year. Oh, gosh. they was it? Oh boy, God, I hope it, feels it was. Like it was a little while longer than that, but I could have lost track of time. You might be right, but it was uh, Tesla Project Love Day. Is they just basically held this contest? Their shtick is they don't advertise traditionally the way like most advertisers or car makers do on mm -hmm. TV. So they said, you know what? We'll have a fan uh, contest where you make a video, thirty seconds or less, as like your own ad and we'll pick a winner and show it on stage and recognize those top three winners. And immediately I was like, I gotta do this. I got I have the car, like, like there's no way I'm not making this. <laughs> this I gotta try I to make do. a car video. And so it was just like me, Andrew, and like two of his friends that had another car so we could hang out the back of one car filming the other one. And we just made this 30 second bit and we actually weren't gonna make it. It got up to the deadline and the last two days, the weekend before the deadline, it rained. And we looked at the plans and we saw it's gonna rain you know, we have to cancel this. And then they extended the contest for a couple more weeks. They were for some like, reason. we haven't received Marquez's yeah. video. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think somebody at Tesla was like, I know there's one more coming. Um, so yeah, That's so, they, so funny. they extended it. We made our little video, we submitted it and it ended up winning. Elon tweeted about it. He was into the video. It was shown on stage behind him. And uh, awesome. yeah, that was, that was a pretty sweet. Did moment. you catch some flack for that? No. Not at all. I, I, I would think it'd be a little controversial that like, you got a little bit of social oh, oh, proof that, on your side. That part I did see. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> from being selected. No no offense, yeah. but that's well, kind that's, of like the elephant in the room. <laughs> that's actually what Elon commented on because a lot oh, of people really? were, were tweeting like, of course he won, he's the guy who can retweet his entry and get lots of retweets. Uh, um, but then Elon said, hey look, I watched all three of the top winners to make sure I agreed with the selection and I agreed and that video was great. So thanks, Elon. Thanks, Elon. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> yeah. You mentioned earlier almost 100 videos. It's not quite the end of the year yet when we're recording this, but yeah. it, it, this will come out in 2019. So I assume you'll have hit 100 videos this year, which I was am, your goal. I'm I currently believe. editing video number 97, okay. and it's mid, it's December 18th. Mm -hmm. So I feel pretty confident right now. Yeah. Yeah. How many are you cranking out right now? I mean, it's it's one every three days, basically. Yeah. So last year, is that, your, is that like the thing that you're kind of like? Well, that's just for that's is? literally just if I extrapolate and do the math. I don't have a schedule. Yeah. I just I just finish the video that I'm working on, and when it's done, I roll over and start the next video. Sounds like just OG YouTube. It's kind of just <laughs> it's it's been a privilege because I know a lot of people who need to focus on growth of the channel need to po publish more sure. often, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm really fortunate not to be in that position and have that burden. So yeah, I just kind of. Do you, okay, so actually that's a good question. Do you think every three days is like what keeps you excited, interested, you couldn't do more, you couldn't do less? I think I could do more and I would not be as proud of the final result. I think if I tried to crank out more videos, and I, I was actually asked this by YouTube, they're like, what if you wanted to make as much money on the platform as possible, what would you do? And one of the parts of my answer was, I would make a video every day, of course. That's mm -hmm. gonna show yeah, up more, get sure. recommended more. But part of, what I enjoy about production is the production itself, and yeah. that takes a lot of time. Yeah. So at the rate I'm going, I'm literally working as fast as I can, and 
and those videos take three days. So, yeah. With one a of, team right now of three, right. addi- in addition to you. Correct. Um, so a team of four, and you have, a, and you have an office dog, who exactly. I'm sure helps with morale. Yeah, yeah, all the time. So that's, that's really cool, because one of my questions for you was around quality. Like, mm-hmm. this is such an arbit- arbitrary term. Everybody's trying to come up with their version of quality is, you know, YouTube sat me down once and said, why are you making three videos a week? Why don't you just make one? And I think they're, they're really careful about how they, how they talk to different creators because they see the promise in some who should maybe spend some more time on their projects. Mm-hmm. And then there's others who have, who do absolutely excellent work and only need three days yeah. to do that. So what do you think makes a quality video for you? It, it, it may not necessarily only, always be just like, get it done as fast as possible. That's obviously gonna take away quality. Yeah. But what would you also not feel good about even if it took three to four days? So production quality has always been like a shtick. Like it mm-hmm. started off as like an extra bonus of the channel mm-hmm. and now it's just kind of baked in as what you sort of expect. Yeah. Um, but I would say that most of my time is actually in the organization and writing and trying to turn this clump of information into like a watchable format. Mm-hmm. So it, it sort of has a story and an order to it and it's organized. That takes like a, a long time for me. That's many hours in a day. Um, once we actually get to now we have something like a shot list and we're going to start making this video, then we're all really good at that. We know mm-hmm. how to get the camera in the right places and do lights and, and post-production. But by the time you add all those things together, it's like three days working on a five minute video. But I feel like it's worth it because if you try to cut that down to a one day process, you miss out on a lot of that. Um, and I think that's what makes that's what we have fun with and that's what makes the channel what it is. So yeah. I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah, and I think your audience appreciates the time in between because they know that's how like how much of your own energy is going into that. Where yeah. they probably see a lot of channels that used to be very personable to them and then over time, you know, teams get to be so big on some channels that it's sort of like this is a little bit too yeah. commercialized. Yeah, and that and even like as a viewer, I I think I I'm subscribed to a couple people that upload every day mm-hmm. and it feels like I can just miss a video sometimes and it's no big deal cuz it'll be back tomorrow. Yeah. And I feel like there's the other channels I'm subscribed to that upload once every 3 weeks and I'm not missing when they upload because I know that they're uploading for a reason. They're not just pushing out fluff. Do you have some channels that you have notifications turned on for? Yeah. yeah. I mean Vsauce like that's one of those channels You've where like, always watched I've Vsauce. always been a, a yeah. Vsauce subscriber. So like when Vsauce drops his first video in two months, you're like, well, he worked on this and he's, and he's not just putting this out just to have a video out. He's putting this out because this is important. So yeah. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. So yeah, it kind of feels like there's, you got to think about that as a viewer. Uh, and I think about the production side a lot as a viewer of other channels. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as we were talking about production quality and you were talking about writing, I had a flashback of like CES. Mm. So funny. I just found this is, Austin's going to hate me. I have this photo in my phone of us like kind of all in a hotel room where you guys were all kind of de- uh, deciding what your videos were going to be. Mm. And it, this was an interesting transition, I think, from where you guys would try to crank out as much content as possible at something like a CES. Yeah. And you would try to do it while we were on site for the week. CES is weird. Yeah. And then I think this in 2014 was when you guys were kind of like, you know what? Let's make something more quality. Let's not just crank out a bunch. And let me assess this particular area of CES only or something like that. But this photo is of Austin recording his voiceover. Okay. At like the dinner table or something. Yeah. And I think meanwhile, you are in a separate room either writing or recording yours. Yeah. And I just remember <laughs> going, yep, this is what it's like to hang out with you two at a right. conference. <laughs> I think that also it's interesting you point out that shift because that kind of comes with a change in position. Like mm. when it's your first or second CES and you've paid for those flights and you pay for that hotel, now your mentality is like, I got to make up for what I just spent. Absolutely. And there's no way two videos covers that. Like, I need to get as much out of the CES as possible. And you probably miss out on a lot of the more fun, casual experiences sure. of CES while you try to make 70, 30,000 videos. But to be fair, those first couple of years at CES, oh, you probably learn a not, lot. Yeah, you learn a lot. And you're also probably not invited to as many really cool things. That is also true. So <laughs> the shift, not. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the shift comes where they're like you, you suddenly, not suddenly, but you end up at like your fifth CES yeah. where like now you kind of know what CES is and you have a different angle to attack it from. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's fun thinking back on that. 
Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, I'm sure it's changed for you wildly every single year. So that's, mm. um, that's a big one. But now we were just talking before we started recording about how crazy this industry actually is that you are in where there's so many, it used to be, correct me if I'm wrong, most of these tech companies would be unveiling their product at CES. Yeah. And then I think it was what, Apple and Microsoft that started to change the and way Samsung. that was done and Samsung. Yeah. And now it seems like everyone wants to have their own event and you guys are just jet setting everywhere. Oh, yeah. oh my God. I have so many miles. That's the upside. But <laughs> Who do you fly with? Uh, United. United. I got so United it was eight, has your miles. I started when it was Continental. So like I have a lot of oh, United wow. history. Yeah. When <laughs> You've they been bought flying up that a long company. time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so that must be keeping you really busy and it just seems like there's always something to talk about, which I, I think most people struggle with the most with consistency of content when you say yeah. not having something to talk about. Oh, that's the that's a huge plus of being in tech is the pressure isn't on me so much to make interesting content mm. or come up with new jokes or a new skit. It's the the pressure's kind of on the tech industry to make exciting new products and then I cover it. And I, I cover it in a different unique way and it's, there's sort of pressure on me to deliver in that regard, but yeah, the the pressure's not really on me to make the tech cool. That's that just kind of so happens. That's so crazy to think about because what that truly means is what you do is traditional media for tech now. Yeah. Truly. Because your job is to report it. Yeah. And that's that's just crazy to think about because your job is to, to do the best job possible for that, but also just to kind of have an opinion on whether or not it's the right purchase decision for somebody. Yeah. So you get the influencer and the reporting side. Yeah, and you kind of, you, you inject a little opinion in there because obviously anyone can just point a camera at the device and read the spec sheet and turn it off. But there's also the whole, do I like it or not? Do I recommend it? Would I buy this myself? And I think staying consistent and true to that is a big part of what carries people watching from video to video. If, mm. a, if a crazy phone comes out at CES, I can point a camera at it and read the specs, or I can tell you, this looks crazy, but I wouldn't get it because here's what I'd rather have. And that's a very different video despite showing the same things. So I guess the only pressure on us is to come up with our thoughts on something as we're trying to analyze it. And we've gotten better at it as time has gone on, but yeah, it does kind of feel like it's part you could say journalism in yeah. a way, or reporting, I think is the word. But yeah, yeah it's it's definitely a, a bit of an opinion-driven thing, too. How do you think um, collaboration on YouTube has changed over the last few years? Do you tend to collaborate a lot? Um, and when I say collaboration, I, that means a lot of things these days. Yeah. But I, I specifically mean with other creators. Has that? Do you think that's changed a lot because of how YouTube operates now? Yeah, there's there's a lot more thought, and I think it's evolved for sure. I kind of remember the first collabs I ever did were <laughs> much more casual. Mm -hmm. I, I literally now I, now that I think back, now that Austin's the star of this podcast, I remember <laughs> I remember Austin and I collaborated once, and we literally made a video in our own style for upload on the other person's channel. And I don't know if that would fly today, maybe yeah. in some communities, no, maybe the beauty community. I, I remember know. this, yeah. And it, it, I think if you bookended it right, like if you opened up the video yeah. and let somebody do like a takeover. Right. Takeovers That's, were hot for a while, especially like Snapchat takeovers and things like I that. I feel like we did the takeover before it was a, th yeah. before it was a thing, before what you called name. it a takeover. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was, that was many years ago. But now the collab is much more calculated. I just did a whole interview all about how do you collab appropriately and how do you maximize the benefits of everyone involved in the collab. And there's... Yeah as a whole analytics side of it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I just want it to be a win, win, win. Right. Is what I call it. A win for you, a win for whoever you collaborate with, and a win for the audience that gets a better video out of it. Yeah. Hopefully, I mean, like, they're, because they're going to be number one no matter what. Yeah. Like, so that's a successful collab. Even you don't collab. come before that audience. It's got to be what they would want. Otherwise, the channel is going to shift. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So speaking of collab. Mm. <laughs> really, really pulling for a Will Smith collab. I am super into it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's good. I'm a fan. You're a fan. So yeah. we're all on board for that. Um, I, I can't not talk. I don't usually talk about timely things, but uh, the YouTube Rewind situation just happened. If you're not familiar with this, YouTube does a video every year for what has it been? Five or... 2011 six? was the first 2011. one. 2011. Oh, God, this while. So seven years. Um, where they kind of just point out the hot stuff that has happened on YouTube uh, for a year. And I was so excited to hear Will Smith say your name yeah. at the beginning of this video. I was so 
pumped for you that you kind of got to be in this like opening. I don't know anything about Fortnite, but Fortnite yeah, moment. I, yeah. And then, you know, sort of the whole YouTube um, audience kind of decided that this wasn't the right cadence for what the YouTube Rewind should be. I thought you did an excellent response to this as somebody who was in the video. And I think there are people in it that have been very carefully responding to this because YouTube is the mothership and sometimes you don't want to rattle the mother mothership too much, but you yeah. were in a video that is now the most disliked video on the YouTube platform, it's true. much to the chagrin of Justin Bieber. I think he was really hoping to hang on. That was his calling card. That's how he introduced himself, I'm sure. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But how are you recovering? <laughs> Honestly, it was, yeah, the, so I made a response video, obviously, and I talked about like my position, mostly because I don't see other people who were in the video talking about it. Mm -hmm. But I also guess smart. I- Smart, so smart. I do feel more comfortable poking the hand because I've done it in the past year or so, and it, it seems to work when you're telling the truth, basically. Yeah. I did a Dear YouTube video in June, and it, ha it was a similar thing where I was talking about YouTube's sort of lack of communication and their problems, and I, I bookended it with ways to fix it, suggestions for putting things in Creator Studio, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard very shortly after that video from my YouTube contact that this one went all the way up and they're doing it and hopefully your channel's whitelisted for this beta feature that you suggested. Now everyone on YouTube has the feature I suggested. Wow. So You're if I'm telling them- about it? No, it's the, it's the, they tell you now known bugs on the side. Oh. Uh, so if you go to the new Creator Studio beta on the side, it tells you the issues that YouTube's working on that they know are bugs, so you don't have so to depend have to on keep maybe tweeting them tweeting. Things. Yeah. yeah. So stuff like that. Yeah. So I feel like if I'm telling a truth and I'm delivering an honest perspective, then I do, I do feel comfortable because you can't say I'm like manipulating anything. Right. So yeah, I told my truth about my involvement in Rewind and gave a unique perspective, and I, I feel like it's, it's out I there I thought now. it was... And I think Philly D pointed out something similar that it was a, a really important distinction that you made with this balancing act that YouTube has to do with not just its creators, but making its advertisers happy. Yes. And it's just the reality of the game now, right? I mean, we're, we're all in business when we engage in YouTube, whether we're a viewer, watching the ads, clicking on the ads, um, buying from an influencer, or if we're a creator and we're profiting from even just uploading much less if we get a sponsor or something like that. So yeah. I agree. I think you just told the truth. Yeah. And it was great. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole, you have to see it from both sides. Every yeah. time YouTube has an issue, I often see it very distinctly from both sides that aren't able to listen to the other. I'll see it, I went to a, a meeting with literally with Google. I sat like a couple seats over from Larry, Larry Page and I'm like listening to them talk about the problems on YouTube and what they need to do. And it's very, very different from the discussions that you see on YouTube channels about YouTube's not listening to us, YouTube needs to do all these things. And there's like no overlap between the two. So me standing back and seeing both of those perspectives, I feel the need to like introduce them to each other, yeah. maybe merge them together a little bit and hopefully that helps. But it's always, it's always fun hearing both yeah. sides. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, it, it's funny just getting to know you and um, some of my other YouTube creator friends over the last, like, I guess it's been 10 years, and also starting a business in the last also 10 years, and being in those two spaces, I've also found myself in a similar spot, right? How can I take both of the best of both of these worlds mm -hmm. and try to figure out how to do everything right? And I'm curious to hear how you have navigated growing your business in the last few years. Because I feel like we've had talks in the past where you are such a true creator on a lot of levels that this idea of like growing, expanding, hiring, I mean, your space here is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And it, all, it serves a lot of purposes for you because I know your videos are so incredible and high quality. Thank you. Um, how has it been growing your business? Is it sort of like this thing you felt like you had to do because you had to keep up with the momentum of your channel? Yes and no. Uh, I kind of felt like I've created this moving goalpost of how good the videos should be. Um, and I think that comes from being your own biggest critic, but also the evolution of your own skill and, and what you want to make. Mm -hmm. So, you know, making videos in my college apartment, for example, for, I guess it was two years, like once I've shot 150 videos in that 20 foot by 10 foot room, you've seen every possible angle of the ceiling, the floor and all four walls that it feels like I, there's nothing left for me to do here. 
creatively, it feels like you need to expand. So coming here didn't feel like a business decision as much as it was kind of like a breaking down some walls and opening new opportunities as far as creative. Mm -hmm. um, we have another space. We kind of have goals of actually expanding from this space, hopefully in the next year or so, which would be really exciting. Um, but the business part kind of comes as a, as a secondary. I think a lot of the expansion, the hiring people, so we can do more things. You can do more with six hands than you can with two. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of those things come from just trying to make different and better videos. And they also happen to be business decisions that you have to justify in the back end too. Yeah. How did you make the decision on who to work with? Um, talent. Yeah. Honestly, the guys, the first guy, Andrew, is already, he, he went to film school, but like straight up logistics beast. And obviously, Vin and Brandon being already YouTubers, actually. Oh, so okay, I, cool. I literally could see their work already. I knew that they not only could operate a camera and do these things, but they kind of have an eye for what I was looking for. So there are other channels that do tons of tech videos and there's a million people to, to look at who'd be willing to hop on board. But they kind of had an eye for that and I feel like that was important to me. So they're just straight up talented. Yeah, it just seems like it would be a really tough decision. Definitely. Because you're offering <laughs> others the ability to, and, and I still struggle with this big mm -hmm. time. I'm still editing all my content because mm -hmm. for me, it's partially my um, creative outlet and I just feel like I know how to time my story and yeah. you know, and so that's yep. part of it, but I'd love to hand the camera off to somebody else. I don't, I don't enjoy that part at all. I'm not yeah. the tech savvy that you are. So you would, so you're, if you were to, the first person you give any creative arm to, what would it be? Would it be the camera or the edit? I think it would be the camera yeah. first. Yes. Although I do think it's super important that I stay true to myself on screen there's a balance between having the one-on-one -on -one conversation and allowing somebody to capture something I'm not going to do a good job of capturing myself if I'm trying to do it. There's a lot of little things yeah. that especially as a viewer I notice, like if even something as small as literally the focal length of the camera, like if you go from shooting by yourself, you're using a wide angle lens and sitting really close to the camera. And then when you can go from someone shooting you, they can be further away with a tighter lens. But the compression of the background to me feels third person. And that's the difference between a 20 mil and a 50 mil lens to me. And I notice that it doesn't feel as personal when mm -hmm. someone switches from shooting their own videos to having their video shot by someone else. Definitely. And tiny stuff like that adds up. You start to see the, the audio is processed differently. The, some, the editor used a different filter than they usually use. Like something tiny like that. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but like, to the I'm creative glad you arm. said that. I'm hoping it's not just because we create. I do think that that makes the difference. And there are creators who I know they have staff because they show them off all the time. They have mm -hmm. a specific photographer, a specific person doing um, some video work whenever they can't do it themselves. It's the personal moments that they still do, the, the less than extraordinary video that they still include. Mm -hmm that makes it all come full circle and allows for the fancy stuff that you might pepper in in between yeah. to work because you still get the origin. That feels like maybe my biggest challenge at this point mm. because taking one of the things that I've, especially in the last year, been thinking about a lot more is production value and making things that are hard to replicate. We have a robot that moves the camera in yes, ways humans can't move. Yes, you casually mentioned that earlier and I was pretending like I understood it's, and saw it. <laughs> it's a huge deal for us, but we did this because not only is it like incredibly dope tech, but like this camera move or this robot can do things that are really hard to replicate. Mm. And that's like something that can separate you from all 350 channels trying to do basically the same thing. Um, but also when you do those things, you kind of make it like that overly cinematic and dramatic, like fancy, like, is this personal anymore? Is mm -hmm. this a business video? Is this an ad or a promo? So it's kind of like you're walking a tightrope of like, I want this video to be really dope, yeah. but I don't want it to feel like too inauthentic or there's right. weird words to describe it. So right, no, but I mean, it's true. Act. It's a balance because you're trying to figure out you want the audience to still to still feel like it's you. On yeah. some level, the prestige that you expect of yourself, they feel that and they still know it's you. Yeah. But they also are like, hmm, this could be on cable, probably, because mm -hmm. it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's yeah, there's different there's different ways of, of attacking. Okay, it. so let's let's dig into you as a creator. What mm -hmm. video editing software are you you're editing right now? I'm watching you edit your mm -hmm. awards yeah. for twenty eighteen. Smartphone awards happening. Uh, I'm a Final Cut editor. 
Final Cut. Yes. So I just want my staff to know that this is the reason I'm on Final Cut Pro. Um, they're all using Adobe and they think I'm crazy. I was on Adobe Premiere and you guys showed me the way with yeah. the rendering time. And it that's, was that's all it took to switch me. Yeah. yeah. I know this is super video talk, but this stuff matters when you oh, want to get a video out on Especially time. Especially when I'm out there. Uh, you know what I did recently? You know what's in that gigantic case over there? What's that? It's the iMac that I brought to the Apple event in California. <laughs> I... <laughs> I rolled out of the airport with an iMac in a box. So it was your carry-on? Uh, it was not my carry-on. So that, I had to check that. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Literally, the rule of check bag is mm -hmm. do not put your laptop in the bag. You put an iMac in Horrible a check idea. bag. Horrible. That's a terrible idea. Yes. Did anyone advise you otherwise? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on paper, though, here's my logic, is I've gone to these Apple events. I've done it multiple years in a row now, and I always bring the same highest end I can afford MacBook Pro. I'm also always shooting 8K, yes. red, raw, and I have to transcode. And the MacBook Pro can handle the import and the edit, and I can make the video. But when I hit export on the MacBook Pro, I go to sleep, and I wake up, and it's hopefully halfway done. Oh, wow. That's what rendering is like from Final Cut Pro on a MacBook Pro when you have that kind of footage. I could be stubborn, or I could be less stubborn and shoot less ridiculous footage. I could go there with a Canon DSLR or something sure. like that but I'm stubborn, yeah. so my solution was I'm gonna bring an iMac Pro instead of a MacBook Pro, and that will help me, and believe it or not, I made two videos in one night, the night of the Apple event this difference. year, and that would not have happened if I hadn't lugged that thing through the airport, so. Okay, this is, do you remember when it used to be like the biggest travesty in the world, though, to publish a video and there's an error? And you should have oh, caught yeah. it before. <laughs> yeah, is that is that as bad for you now as it was when you were on Adobe because you're shooting 8K? I'm a little more careful now, um, and I watch the whole video after it's exported so that I don't catch it too late. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it, honestly, like if I was if I was on oh god, I don't even want to think about the if I was on oh, okay. a MacBook Pro with final with uh, with the Adobe, Adobe suite mm -hmm. with Premiere, and I found a mistake after I finished exporting, I am. Crying. probably just gonna upload that <laughs> oh, I, exactly. I don't have the time i have to fly in like a couple hours like i can't render this again yeah. um so yeah i do now so like that was you know that's like a six hour export versus a 25 minute export if i find a mistake i'll fix it, it takes yeah. 25 more minutes but that is something that was much bigger deal back now then. it's more of an annoyance for me because i'm just little 1080p over here so i'm just like oh man that's i'm a jealous typo. Oh, well. how long how long does it take to export uh, at, lately, I've been doing about 15 minute videos, and so the export time has been one to maybe, one. Maybe, yeah, maybe 20 minutes on a bad day. That's awesome. It's so fast. It's so fast. Yeah. And that's how it should be. You that's know? how it should be. It doesn't, it feels like I shouldn't have to think about it. I hit export. I and that, go again, grab is it. if we're yeah. talking about levels upon levels of editing, not just. I threw a couple clips in there and exported right. it, and they just happened to be long. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's wild. Hashtag worth it. Yeah, right. Grab yourself a Pelican case, get your iMac to CES, do what you gotta do. <laughs> I just can't even. Okay, <laughs> so, so um, what about holding the camera? Are you holding the camera a lot lately, or is your staff doing that a lot more for you? That's part of this balancing act, right? It is. Uh, I am still, I mean, the camera. When I say holding the camera, I know you don't usually hold the yeah, camera. Yeah, it's on a tripod or whatever <laughs> in front of me, but... I, was, I would say things like uh, set design and lighting and a little bit more creative expression and things like the background and, and where I'm sitting uh, has been more heavily influenced and I think for the better. And I, I sort of let that, that exploration yeah. continue. Um, but as far as like holding the camera, I'm still 75% of it for most of the normal tech videos. For car videos, Not very little. Yeah. Very little of me holding the camera. Because you get to drive. Because I'm driving. It makes sense, yeah. it makes total sense. <laughs> Um, so what is your day like? I mean, you can choose your hours. Mm -hmm. You're a YouTuber. You get to choose what days you upload. You you have you told me before we started recording. We talk about too much before we started recording. I just have so many questions. But um, just like old school YouTube, you know, when you're done editing a video, you have to get it out. So yeah. it could be any time of day. Any hour. But what is your morning routine look like? Do you ever feel like you've got to get in here by a certain time? Or what do you do to get the day started right? I'm usually, especially late in the production process, I'm usually pretty eager to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say the production process, I, we have several types of days. We have writing days, which are, you know, research and a lot of clicking and finding things to talk about and writing everything down and organizing it, that's less exciting. I don't necessarily yeah. get 
pumped about writing days. But then we have production days and, and post-production, which is editing days. And those are the ones that I'm like pumped and like get up early for. Like, yeah, we're shooting McLaren from like 7 a.m. because the sun comes out. Like that's <laughs> the fun, like exciting sort of day. I'd say typically I try to, as a air quotes again, boss, mm-hmm. I try to get the guys in at like a nine to five, sort of a reasonable hour. You can have a social life if yeah. you work for me. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we come in at a normal nine o'clock hour and we all just work until it's done. And then we're on to the next one. It's easy. So today I'm here at, I don't know, it's seven now, but like I'll be here till probably eight or nine yeah. when the edit's done. I'm actually almost done, so that's great. I feel like I'm holding up the award no, ceremony. It's it's <laughs> going live today and I am almost done. And literally as soon as I watch it over the last time, I hit export and I make the thumbnail. A lot of people find the, the order that I do it interesting. I finish the edit, export it, start the upload, then decide the title and thumbnail then make the title and thumbnail. Then you, but you kind of have an idea of what the title is. You I just kind of title. flesh out like the exact wording. Yeah, I, I, I put together what I think the title is gonna be, fix it up, it's done, and then the thumbnail happens after the upload. Okay, I'm gonna ask somebody who's very high up on the Team Crispy scale, Okay. which is so underground language, I'm not gonna explain it. It's but <laughs> what makes for a totally ideal crispy thumbnail what is your mm. process for that photo because that is if if no one's ever heard me talk about this on stage or in my book or whatever that is the re- well it used to be gosh it changes so much every day but that is the visual connection people make with a video before they decide to opt into it to go into an experience and press play which is not the same on any other platform although it's changing it seems like daily uh, now we can actually watch the video in the app which is blowing my mind at the moment yeah. without pressing play but that thumbnail is still super important so so what's the secret? That's a great point. Um, my priority for a thumbnail is it has to look good first as a tiny, small, mm-hmm. small image because that's where you see it on the YouTube. <laughs> on the YouTube. On the YouTube. That's where you see it on the tubes. <laughs> uh, and then it also shows up as a possibly Instagram image. It's a little bigger. Or a Twitter image alongside the video. It's a little bigger there. So what do you mean by that? Like you're kind of like cl- sh- making it small to look so, at it, expanding it, thinking like what does it look like in these different spaces? Yeah, honestly, the simpler the better. A lot of a lot of tech is very complex and looks really weird and has all these angles you can shoot mm. it from. But if you can zoom in and get like the, the obvious defining characteristic and fill as much of the frame with that as possible, that's probably a pretty good because identifying Because you don't want thumbnail. someone to mistake that you have the actual item your title is talking about. Right. And that's that yeah. identification. There. So, okay. so it's a generally much simpler aesthetic for the tiny thumbnail. But then obviously for the, the larger, somebody seeing it on Twitter or mm. like Facebook or something like that, where they might click in and actually look at it like a picture, then I'm thinking about the smaller details, the textures, the colors, so things like that. So you're saying that those things are different, that you wouldn't upload the same thing everywhere. Oh, it's the same thing. It is, every like but the same actual photo? It's the same exact photo. Okay. But as far as composition, I'm first getting close and, and making a simple like determination about what needs to be in the thumbnail. Mm. And then I adjust small details after that based on the people looking at it in a bigger place. Gotcha. So it's all the same image. The last one I did with the McLaren. So this is a red car. So like obviously I'm I'm zoomed in pretty close on the red car. The background is a little bit blurred, so it's pretty focused and clear on a tiny thumbnail. Okay. Just a red car. Mm-hmm. But if you blow up this image and look at it on Twitter or Facebook, you can see my face in the driver's seat of the car. Yeah. You can see the cars around me on the road. Mm-hmm. You can see the license plate. All these things become more interesting details and that I'll edit and make it look all pretty. But that's the difference between the tiny thumbnail on YouTube, little red car, and the big image you see somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Well, like I was saying before, I mean, I think it's just sort of typical practice. People just say, like, I'm going to make this one photo, Mm -hmm. hope for the best, yeah, and then put it everywhere. It's usually not a bad idea. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's a good way to get it out, but it's probably not a great way to learn about what's actually converting. True. Yeah. Yeah. I wish you could, I mean, there's so many things I wish you could do on YouTube, but if you could A-B test thumbnails... YouTube sometimes does it for you without you knowing. Oh but if you could A B <laughs> test if you get A B test thumbnails, that would be very interesting. Um, yeah. But I, I think after this point, I'm a, th- a thousand videos in, I have a pretty good idea of like what works for what I'm talking How about. How important do you think um, your face is in a thumbnail? Do you think that those have 
Well, let's just say in general, like a, a video that's more folk. I guess you're in all of your videos now. Mm-hmm. It's not just the tech. Was there? There was a time though where it was just the tech. I used to not show my face at all, mm-hmm. um, and I have changed that and I've made it more personable. So I'm pretty much always on camera at some point in the videos. I think I decide to show my face in the thumbnail certain times when I think it is worth adding to just the device. Sometimes you just see the device and it's not enough to want to click on it. The device and the title, an example might be the Pixel Slate video. I happen to think it's an absolute garbage product. <laughs> so so in this video thumbnail, you might see this next year when I actually upload it, but I'm probably gonna have to show the device and like a frowning face of some kind yeah. so that you get the idea before you click in. Because if you click in and you just see this shiny device and then suddenly it starts getting trashed on, you're a little caught off guard. So I feel like when there's something else I need to convey besides just the device, I think that's when I use my own face. Is if there's an important emotion. Yeah. That you're trying yeah, yeah, yeah. to, you're not trying to mislead someone into saying this is the best phone ever because I'm just showing you the phone. Right. You In that instance, you'll feel like. Yeah, I'll use my more. face. I don't just have my face in it for the sake of my face, but I'll use my face to convey like some additional information or emotion. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, this is a little bit of a different kind of interview because uh, I have my husband here and a member of my team and they were really looking forward to seeing your space and yeah. meeting you. And so I just am curious to hear if Vin or Blake have any questions for Marquez. What tips do you have for YouTubers that want to start doing tech reviews now in a space that's so saturated? Definitely. Saturation. Um, well, the, the, tips the, for newbies. The main concern, I think a lot of new, especially tech, like tech used to be like 25 channels. Now it's 25,000 tech channels. So it's really hard to, the barrier to entry is low, yeah. but the barrier to like standing out from the massive saturation of all those channels is pretty high. Um, well, I mean, if you think of if let's just say a lot of these channels were like, I'll just do it Marquez's way, and they're just trying to take fancy, f- you know, photos of the phone. Yeah, they're trying to beat you at right. that same game. Not the move. Um, <laughs> I think the best thing you can do is obviously number one, enjoy what you're doing, so you have no problem if it fails. Mm-hmm. Just have fun with it. But number two, your own voice and your own perspective and your own history and and the more you learn about other products and things that came before it, the more you can inject into that that isn't in other videos, the better. So if you have, like obviously you might be influenced by watching other channels and that might change your creative style or the way you shoot the video, but the more things you can personally say or include in the video that aren't in other videos, the better. It's easier said than done. You have to like think about it for a while and come up with good stuff. But that's, I think, a, a way to come up with new perspective. I think the way I was describing it recently, there's like all these, uh, it's like so nuanced. Like there's mini genres, like there's tech YouTube, which is like reviewing. But then there's like tech reviewers that hate Apple. And that'll be like oh, their whole angle God. is everything they talk about. It's... They I mean, have to mention how they hate Apple. Or, because I can't even tweet you without having the Apple haters tweet well, me that's back. A, it's for a no reason. Angle. We could talk about something else completely. Yeah. that's a, <laughs> So you have to like, so that'll be a whole thing. Tech YouTubers that love Apple. Everything they do, they will find a way to see if they can justify what Apple's doing. It's an interesting perspective. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a good or bad idea. But then there will be tech YouTubers that love Apple, ironically. So that's a whole new subgenre. <laughs> so they'll they'll like make they'll go over the top of like how much they love Apple just right. to prove a point about how dumb it is because they don't actually. So it's like there's all these like <laughs> subgenres trickling down in different ways to differentiate, um, which I guess proves there's still ways to do it. Yeah. But I just find it entertaining because I find a new channel every day that it's like wow this guy's oh he's a music producer that loves cowboy hats but never shoots anywhere other than his basement. Got it. Okay. <laughs> And then that's a whole angle for the whole thing. So yeah, there's there's fun ways to, to differentiate I think still. a really cool piece of advice there, key piece of advice would be just start, but find your own way to do it. You're yeah. not gonna be anybody else. You can't be anyone else, you can be you, but yeah. just, just get started. And just do it. Marquez, you've been hanging on strong for 10 years. It's incredible. I want to call you Mark Ass Brownlee, though, oh, because man. that's what PewDiePie <laughs> said in his review of, okay, I didn't yeah. know if he knew who you were, 
I, you guys have I to watch know. this video if you yeah. haven't seen it. It's so funny. I think PewDiePie is so funny. I don't know if that's on brand for me or not, but it is just, he cracks me up. And he's watching the video and he heard your name, but he didn't understand what Will Smith said. Yeah, like he has his own <laughs> accent and I guess his ears have their own like yeah. so subtle accent too. I thought that was funny. It was just actually. funny to see him then apologize to you because like, oh, of course I know yeah. who that is. Yeah, yeah. That, that was, was really just funny. amazing. Anyway, before I ask you my last question, because you've got to get to this video. It's got to get out. I'm holding we'll it edit. up. it. Um, where can everyone follow you if they have not already? Sure. Uh, same five letters everywhere. So MKBHD on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Plus. No, not Google Plus. Not Google Plus. <laughs> it's <laughs> dead. Back. It's dead. Is it dead yet, though? I think it is. Did is it Google actually? Plus die? I think Google Plus died. Yeah, they officially I, shut down. I think it's about to die. Really? Oh, I thought it was gone. They're gone. They're like gonna pull it in like April or something. Oh my gosh, they're yeah. like last chance guys. Yeah, so don't, so not Google Plus, but those five letters everywhere else. Um, <laughs> speaking of five letters, is the case a secret still? It is still. Okay, Yeah. I didn't even realize I didn't know what the case stood for until somebody tweeted it recently and I was like, oh, okay, cool, there's a secret. <laughs> yeah, 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 you gotta wait. Oh, we've decided that when we hit 10 million subscribers, then I'll, I'll just find a How new thing to keep secret. How far away are you? Uh, Two and a half million away. Wow. So a couple, wow. little while. You actually might get another trophy then. That <laughs> That's the next pretty, big one. <laughs> pretty crazy. That's a crazy amount of digits, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, last question. Yeah. What does it mean to you to go after the life that you want? What does it mean to me? I I think a lot of it is the uh, the enjoyment of the journey and not the result. Um, I kind of mentioned it earlier, the, the whole goal of the channel is sort of just moving goalposts. I'm never going to finish. I'm never going to make the perfect video and leave. So this whole journey of improvement and trying to make better uh, is the fun part. So I, I kind of just keep kicking in a weird analogy, if I can butcher this analogy anymore. I'm just, just kicking at these moving goalposts over and over every day. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Love it. Thanks yeah. for having me at your office, Marquez. Thanks, Thanks for, for being stopping on the by. show. All right, let's do a detail recap. First, find a way to do something better than the way it is now. It's tough to do that right because we like to blame saturation on a lot of things. Oh, it's already been done. Everything's already been done. But try. Just do something a little bit better, something the way that you would like it or people like you would like it. And then see how you like it. Marquez's first video was one that was inspired by the fact that he watched a lot of videos to vet a laptop he wanted to buy. And then he found out when he got that laptop that he did not get all the information. So he stepped up and just made a better review. That was in high school, it continued to take off and he fell in love with this hobby that later became a passionate business. So if you are thinking, oh, I wanna do something for myself but I don't know what to do, just Start trying things and see what you like because you need to be honest about what you enjoy. Don't do something just because it's hot right now or worse, copy others. Do you and be you because like Marquez said, even if it fails, which hopefully it won't if you stick it out, you'll be sticking it out because you love it. And even on the tough days of something you love, you'll still wake up and be excited about what you get to do. Marquez uses Final Cut Pro for editing. I also recommend this software. Um, I kind of talked about this briefly and, and, and kind of jokingly. My team at Aftermark uses the Adobe Suite. So they use Adobe Premiere Pro for editing. These are kind of the top two applications that tend to be where most professional video, video editors hang out. So those are the two you're, you're really thinking about. If you think, okay, I'm not professionally editing video yet, help me out here. Final Cut Pro could be in your future if you're a Mac user. And if it's not time yet, then I would start with iMovie because they very much are similar looking spaceships where it'll make more sense to you when you finally want to step into something that can do more and be more robust like Final Cut Pro if you start with something that looks similar. So start with iMovie. 
if you are on a Windows platform, then I would look at just basically anything that comes with the computer. Just start to experiment with what those are. Windows Movie Maker, I think, is still in existence. And then maybe eventually you will get to Adobe Premiere Pro. But I have to say, Adobe Premiere Pro is kind of a, a crazy monster to master. So um, just start with what you can now. And there's a lot of intermediate editors available and lots of free editors for your phones. Video editing today is totally different. So just try something. Collaborate strategically. I love this advice. It should be win, win, win. A win for you, a win for the person you're collaborating with, and a win for the audience. This goes for other creators. This goes for maybe working with sponsors. You shouldn't just work with a sponsor because they're willing to pay you anything. You should work with them because you love them and because it's actually a reflection of what you could be doing better for your audience. So win, win, win is how you collaborate. And when you're designing that thumbnail for a YouTube video, really making sure that you look at it all different sizes. If it's as small as being on someone's phone or as large as being on someone's desktop or even their TV in their living room, does it look good? Is it alluring? It Does it make you want to click it and find out more? Really understanding that the design of a photo can make or break a video on YouTube is such a big deal in this industry. So check that out. Thank you so much, Marquez, for being on this show. And make sure you follow him on all the places except for Google+. <laughs> that was so funny. MKBHD is where you can find him. And of course, anything we talked about in the show notes, detailspodcast.com. Just search for Marquez or look for his face on the episodes page. What a great episode. Just curious, do you love getting advice straight to your earbuds? I mean, you're here right now, so I'm thinking you do. If you would like some simple steps for living your very best life every day, I want to send you my free audio training with these seven essential details for going after the life that you want. To receive this audiogram, subscribe to this podcast and take a screenshot to show that you are subscribed. Email that screenshot to hello at detailspodcast.com with audiogram, please, in the subject line, and we will get that right over to you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it as always. If you'd like more actionable details, head over to Amy TV by typing the URL in your browser, youtube.com slash Amy TV, or searching for Amy Landino in your YouTube app. Subscribe for good vibes, kiss the ones you love, and remember, go after the life that you want. Cheers. Cheers.